As Helen mentioned, over the past few weeks, we've been looking at text in the Old Testament, primarily from the book of 1 Samuel. Today our text is from the first chapter of the book of 2 Samuel, and it's kind of a transition piece. We're transitioning from Saul being king to David becoming king, and of course that uh, occurs at the event of Saul's death. The first chapter of 2 Samuel begins with the announcement of that death. In the chapter previously, in 1 uh, Samuel, the last chapter in 1 Samuel, we actually hear the account of Saul's death. As we hear that account, David doesn't know of Saul's death at this point. David is fighting another battle in a different location from the battle against the Philistines that uh, Saul had been fighting in which he died. So as Chapter 1 begins in 2 Samuel. We hear of a person coming and informing David of Saul's death. We hear of that first, and then there's a section I'll skip over uh, that gives us the story of what happened to the person who delivered the news to David, but then we'll begin in David's response to the news of Saul's death. Chapter 1, verse 1, 2 Samuel. After the death of Saul, when David had returned from defeating the Amalekites, David remained in Ziklag. On the third day, a man came to Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. When he came to David, he fell down on the ground and did obeisance. David said to him, where have you come from? He said to him, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. David said to him, how did things go? Tell me. He answered, the army fled from the battle, but also many of the army fell and died, and Saul and his son Jonathan also died. And then going to verse 17. David intoned this lamentation over Saul and his son Jonathan. He ordered that the song of the bow be taught to the people of Judah. It is written in the book of Jashar, he said, Your glory, O Israel, lies slain upon your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Goth, for came it not in the streets of Ashkelon, or the daughters of the Philistines will rejoice, the daughters of the uncircumcised will exult. You mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor bounteous fields. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul anointed with oil no more. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, nor the sword of Saul return empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and in death they were divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul. Who clothed you with crimson and luxury, who poured ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan lies slain upon your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Greatly beloved were you to me. Your love to me was more wonderful, passing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen, and the weapons of war perished. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, pour out your spirit upon us so that we might hear this ancient word, this song of David anew today. Pour out your spirit into our hearts. Heal the places where we grieve and sorrow. Help us to understand events occurring around us. Give us voices to proclaim your goodness and your praise throughout the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. How the mighty have fallen. We've gotten used, I think, to regularly hearing in the news about people of power and prominence or celebrity being caught in some sort of scandal that results in their downfall. Two weeks ago, Robert Morris, who is the founder and pastor of 
the Texas mega church, Gateway Church, resigned after a woman revealed that Morris had abused her years ago when she was a teenager and he was a young pastor. Gateway Church is one of the largest mega churches in the country. It has 10 campuses and the report that 25,000 people attend worship services there every week. In 2016, Morris was a member of President Trump's Faith Advisory Board. And the article about Robert Morris, which I read, the article about his downfall, was linked to another article in Christianity Today about similar accusations against Mike Bickle, founding pastor of another megachurch, the International House of Prayer, Kansas City. He had been defending himself on the church's 24-hour-a-day prayer live stream until the church leaders forced him out and cut him off the air in February. When the superstar celebrity pastors of mega churches fail, it makes the news. Now, whether you consider them among the mighty or not, I guess that's just up to you. And we know, of course, that small church pastors are frequently just as guilty of the same terrible behavior but it doesn't make the news. Maybe we are a little more inclined to experience Schadenfreude. It's a German word. You can ask Tom or Marion how well I pronounced it. Maybe we're, we're inclined to experience that when a celebrity falls from the privilege of their celebrity status. The German word describes the bit of satisfied feeling you get when a celebrity or an opponent, especially someone who parades their own prominence, runs into misfortune, especially self-inflicted misfortune. It is the reaction a lot of people felt a couple of weeks ago when the musical pop star artist Justin Timberlake got pulled over in the very exclusive area of New York called the Hamptons for driving under the influence. First, Timberlake got very mad because the arresting officer didn't recognize him. And then he got even madder because, as he told the police officer, this arrest was really going to mess up his upcoming music tour, disappointing all of his fans. But he got the maddest when the police officer told him he didn't know anything about this upcoming musical tour at all. And he arrested him. How the mighty have fallen, shade and fruit of. Religious leaders who promote their own piety and righteousness, celebrities who celebrate their own fame, and politicians who put themselves above the law and the people they govern. What's the biggest fall of a political leader in your life? I would say for me it was when President Nixon resigned. It had never happened in our history before. I can remember being on vacation with my family at New Smyrna Beach and my parents watching all week long the Watergate hearings the whole time. I could ask them, hey, do you mind if I run down to Daytona Beach? Sure, go ahead. We're just going to be watching TV. It doesn't matter. All week long, glued to the TV. I remember the impersonator Rich Little on Rona Martin laughing, impersonating this and saying, I am not a crook. How the mighty have fallen. We probably wouldn't list that as a particularly Christian virtue, but it does seem to be the default reaction of our culture today. How the mighty have fallen, but of course they had it coming, we're just as likely to say. Which is why David's lament, his response to the death of Saul and Jonathan can be so instructive for us. It prompts us to remember that our lives are not simply a matter of our own personal ambitions or grievances. Our lives are part of something bigger than the accumulation of our personal triumphs or the devastation of our own personal failures. God works in history, and God weaves our lives into God's larger purposes of goodness and blessing for all people. This is a funeral song that David sings out for Saul and Jonathan. Funeral song that he instructs be taught to the entire nation. 
and it reminds us of the importance of putting into words and publicly affirming both our experiences of grief and sorrow and shock and our trust in God. It reminds us of how significant it is for us to acknowledge our shared dependence on God's will for us. We have to remember and live out of our common need together of God's love and goodness toward us. When David learns of King Saul's and Jonathan's death, he, he sings this song and he repeats three times how, how the mighty have fallen, how the, how the mighty have fallen, how the mighty have fallen. There's a poignancy to it, a depth to it. It's a song of real lament and grief. The news of Saul and Jonathan's death does not bring David any joy. We might have expected it to be different. From the beginning, Saul's and David's relationship had been tense and conflicted. It reflected the reality that God withdrew his spirit from King Saul as a result of Saul's disobedience, and he put his spirit on David. In other words, from the moment David is introduced into the story, we know that God's purposes have shifted from Saul to David, even though Saul remains king. Saul still has a hold on the power and the trappings of office, but God's future and Israel's future now lies with David. David, the shepherd boy who triumphed over the giant Goliath when King Saul and all of the army were too afraid to go out and battle him. And in the stories that follow, David, the charismatic and courageous young leader, makes Saul jealous, unpredictable, and intent on destroying him. There are numerous stories of how David just narrowly escapes King Saul's wrath, while at the same time, his popularity and strength as a local hero continues to rise amongst the people. But still, no matter how relentlessly Saul tries to destroy David, David holds on to a sense of reverence for the place and authority of King Saul as God's anointed king. David is a loyalist to the throne, even if Saul, in his hatred for David, cannot see it. When David had opportunities to capture or kill Saul, he is always restrained by this deep belief that no harm should come from David's hand to the Lord's anointed. And no matter what, in David's eyes, Saul is always the Lord's anointed. David has this ability to deeply trust and respond to what he believes are God's intents and purposes working themselves out. David is loyal not only to Saul, but also to Saul's son, Jonathan, with whom he develops a deep, loving friendship and commitment. C.S. Lewis wrote that this friendship between David and Jonathan is the sort of love one can imagine between angels. All of this is to say that when the news of King Saul's and Jonathan's death is delivered to David, it's a devastating blow to him. We might have expected to, to David would greet this news with a sort of relief. He, he might have declared at last I can assume my place without the interference of this discredited old king always fighting to hold on to his power. He might have declared a celebration for the fall of the old corrupt guard and order, but not at all. Rather, David sings a lament and gives orders that everybody learn the song by heart. David publicly shares his deep grief over Saul and Jonathan's death. He takes his personal sorrow and puts it in the voice of all of Israel to acknowledge the tragedy and loss experienced by everyone. He puts into words the reality of Saul's and Jonathan's life and death as a part of God's story. And as a part of God's story, a part of Israel's story, their story. Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann writes that David, in his grief, 
is in his fullest, most faithful, powerful form. David is, David is is able to sort out what is crucial from what is marginal in this moment of transition from Saul's kingship to David becoming king. He's able to get his own mind off of himself and instead to focus with and for his community on the public reality of loss. David is not so consumed, unlike other leaders of our own day, by his own personal ambition that he cannot linger over the greatness of that which is grieved. Here at the moment when he will soon be fully entering into the center of God's story with Israel, he has the capacity to speak of Saul and Jonathan's place in God's story. Your glory, O Israel, he says, lies slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen, Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely. In life and in death, they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of battle. The mighty warriors, fallen, fallen, and the arms of war broken to bits. These are words of grief and lament that acknowledge what was, what is now, and in that acknowledgement and contrast, take us up into a place of openness to God's power to bring forth something new. David's lament reminds us that we ourselves have to put into words this orientation of our lives towards God's unfolding story, God's power to work out and fulfill God's purposes in the future. When people gathered in <clears throat> Gettysburg, Pennsylvania on November 19th, 1863 to dedicate a cemetery at the site of a terrible battle which had occurred about four and a half months earlier on July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, Ever Edward Everett, former senator of Massachusetts, was to be the principal orator and was, and he gave an address on that occasion first that lasted over two hours. After he was finished, President Abraham Lincoln delivered his dedicatory remarks of just over 271 words, which took about two minutes. But they are the words which still have this power to orient us to what we hope and we hope are still striving to live out the highest ideals of our country. Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Are we still striving to orient ourselves to that truth, to discover how it can be worked out now. All men, all people, all peoples are created equal. Lincoln <clears throat> acknowledged why they were there to declare a portion of the field where the great battle had taken place, to dedicate that field to those who had died there in order that the nation might survive. <clears throat> Excuse me. He went on to say, it is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. And then he said, but in a larger sense, but in a larger sense. And it seems to me that these words are the words which open the occasion to something greater than the dedication of a cemetery. These are the words where Lincoln goes and begins to join the past and the present to the great possibility of the future. To resolve that the dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that the government of the people and by the people and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Lincoln's words carried those who listened and the whole nation into this larger sense, the hope in God's purposes for the nation, freedom and democracy for all people. 
as the church, even today, anointed by the Holy Spirit and transformed by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, you and I, as the church today, we're called to put into words our faith in the larger sense of God's will and purpose for all, for everyone. We're joined together by the Holy Spirit in this life given to us in Jesus. In praise of God, that is Jesus' life in the midst of all circumstances. In the church, we're joined to the larger sense of God's story, the promise and power of God's goodness and God's love for all people. We share together in the church, in our life together as the church, in words of lament and praise, grief and gratitude, prayer and promise that lift us up above and beyond ourselves into the very life of Christ. Our words of faith and our experiences of faith open us as we share them together, as we speak them, as we utter the words. They keep us connected to God and to God's story. I know that many of you get a daily email, a weekly email from Richard Rohr and the contemplative society and work that he does. This past week's emails were all about the significance and importance and work of grief and lament in our lives. And one day, Meribai Starr shared how grief had been such a transformative experience, how genuine, deep, sincere lament and working through that, being open to that and what God was doing, how it had been so significant for her and for how she believed God wanted her to live with other people. She wrote, after her daughter died, what I experienced when my daughter died was two things. One was that nobody could possibly know what I was going through right now. But quickly on the heels of that, I thought, oh, every person who has ever experienced the death of a child knows. I was realizing in the bones of my own body that there had been mothers throughout time whose children had died and mothers right now whose children are dying and we all belong to each other. In some ways, she said, that was the first time I ever took my seat in the web of interbeing when I realized that I belong here and we belong to each other. Even if right now it was my turn to be held by that web, and I couldn't imagine it yet, but I knew that somehow, someday, I would be able to do some of that holding of the other mothers to come. And I have, and I do. In the church, we are joined together. In the words by which we share our faith, and open ourselves to God's work in our lives. In the church, we are joined together in this life given us by Christ, through which Christ's very praise of God itself becomes the context and content of our own lives. In the church, sharing together lament and sorrow, prayer and promise, joy and thanksgiving. In the church, we're held together and kept close together to reality. And in that reality, connected to God. This is the way Paul puts it in his letter to the Colossians. This sense of, of the larger sense of Jesus Christ that we are all a part of. Eugene Peterson, in his message, translates it this way. We look at Jesus the Son and see the God who cannot be seen. We look at this Son and see God's original purpose and everything created. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank of angels, everything got started in Him and finds its purpose in Him. He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this very moment. And when it comes to the church, he organizes and holds it all together like a head does a body. He was supreme in the beginning and leading the resurrection prayed. He is supreme in the end. From beginning to end, he's there towering far above everything, everyone. So spacious is he, so expansive 
that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, they get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, his blood that was poured out down from the cross. And you yourselves, Paul says, you yourselves are a case study of what he does. Did you realize that? When you were singing at the beginning of our worship, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my dear Redeemer's praise, the glory of my God and King, the triumph of his grace. Did you realize that when you were singing in response to the news of God's forgiveness to us? Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Did you realize that? When we'll sing at the end of our service today, like David, how firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in God's excellent word. What more can he say than to you hath he have said, to you who for refuge to Jesus hath fled? Fear not, I'm with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God, and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. Did you realize that? Did you experience that? Can you be open to that? What God is doing in us, in Jesus Christ. Amen.